I was a kid, I had a babysitter, and her name was Amy. And Amy was uh, the kind of person you would want to be your child's babysitter. She was incredibly responsible. She was probably the oldest child, so, you know, she, like, followed all of the rules. And she wanted me to do the same. Uh, she was, once again, really kind, kind of quiet. Um, and, and really, my parents had hired her to kind of keep me and my sister in line while they would be off working during the day. And so Amy's job, watch over us, make sure we don't kill ourselves, whatever that might be. Um, and, and she was pretty good at it. Um, except um, I did not want to be kept in line. I wanted to have a good time. You know what I mean? You're young. I was probably eight or nine at the time. And one day I was out playing in the backyard. And, you know, I, I didn't have an Xbox like my kids. You know, we had one channel. There's not much exciting to watch on television. So I was outside playing, and I went behind my dad's shed, and then I noticed it. There was a small pile of brush back there, and I thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a fire. Now, Amy, the good babysitter, would have never advised me or allowed me uh, to start the fire. Uh, so I did what any clear-thinking eight-year-old boy would do. I carefully crept into the house. She was busy reading a book. And so I snuck past her in the living room into the kitchen, uh, got up on the counter in the kitchen, into the upper cabinets where the matches were kept, stowed a few of those bad boys in my pocket, down off the counter, and then crept back through the living room, past the babysitter out the back door. She was none the wiser. It was on. And so I made my way back behind my dad's shed to this little pile of brush. And it was kind of cool. You know, like It was kind of damp, though. And so I wasn't there to make a little bit of smoke. You know, like I wanted to build a fire. And so once again, I did what any clear-thinking eight-year-old boy would do. I went and found an accelerant for the fire. You know what I mean? If you want to build a fire, you clearly need gasoline, or that was my thinking when I was a kid. So I go into my dad's shed, find a can of gasoline, and y'all, this was the first time I'd ever experienced it in my life. And if you're a man, you know what it is. When I poured that gasoline on the fire, it went woof. And then I was hooked. I'm like, that was great. Like, I need to do this again. That was amazing. That is cool whether you're 8 or 38, right? Guys, it never gets old. It's just a really cool thing to have happen. And so I did it a few more times because it was really awesome. And let me just tell you, I didn't just have a little fire and a little brush pile. Like, it was burning and it was exciting. And it was really awesome all the way up until the time that I did it when the fire traveled up the gasoline and actually caught the end, the nozzle of the gas can on fire. And so I'm like, what am I going to do? And so the only thing my mind could tell me to do at that minute was to drop the gas can and run. And so I ran to where my dog's water dish was, and I'm like, I'm going to handle this. No big deal. But when I turned back around, there was a blazing inferno behind me. And I'm like, I'm not going to be able to hide this. And so I go and I try to douse it with water, but it ain't happening. You know, it's a massive fire behind my dad's shed. And finally, after several trips, I began to get the fire to, to die down, and then I saw it. I had melted all of the paint off the side of my dad's boat that was just pretty close to where I was burning this fire. And I'm like, I'm never going to be able to hide this. Like, I may not make it out of this with my life. It was a really bad day. So here's the thing. The, the babysitter... Amy, her job was to keep me out of trouble. Um, she would have clearly told me that was a bad idea. She laid down the rules. I was not supposed to set things on fire. But the problem wasn't with what was right there or her communication thereof. It was that in my little heart, I wanted to play with fire. And as a result, things got burned. In Galatians chapter 3. Paul is writing to the people of Galatia and he's talking to them about the difference between the law and grace. The law is a lot like that babysitter. She's, it, it was there to protect us. It's there to kind of guide us. But it couldn't change our hearts. The people at Galatia, they had come to a place where they were depending upon the law to make them righteous or to justify them before God. But it could never do that. It could never change their hearts. It could never make them clean. It could point them in the right direction, but it could never fully 
uh, justify them before God. And so Paul is writing in the letter and saying, listen, um, two ways to relate to God. One's on the basis of the law, that is empty, uh, but there's a much better way. And it was actually God's intended design for the entire span of history. And that's not that you would be justified on the basis of the law, but rather that you would be justified on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ Alone. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. And he's going to illustrate this for us. This was God's plan the whole time. Galatians chapter 3. He's going to take us back to Genesis uh, chapter 12 is where it begins. He's going to talk to us about Father Abraham. And again, if you think justification by faith is, is just like God's plan somewhere in the New Testament... You've missed it completely. Justification by faith was God's plan the entire time. Look what Paul says here in Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. He says, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. And we get this, right? Um, If you set up a a contract with somebody, you're going to go buy a used car or maybe a home or for whatever it might be that you would want to purchase. When you sign on the dotted line, the terms of the agreement are set in stone. You don't get to go back and renegotiate and be like, you know, I know I told you I was going to pay this much for the car, but I would like to pay half that, right? Once you sign on the dotted line, the agreement is made firm. You don't get to change it after the fact. Right? So that's where Paul started. Now he's going to tell us what the agreement was with Abraham. Verse 16, he says, Now the promises were made to Abraham. Now, if you're a good Jew, looking back to old father Abraham, you would have traced your lineage back to him. You would have known what these promises were. If you don't know the story, God called Abraham out from among his people. and was like, hey, just follow me. I'm going to tell you where you need to go. And then God began to make promises to him. These promises are contained in Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 15, Genesis 17. It's repeated over and over and over. But here's the gist of the promise. He said, Abraham... I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you into a great nation. And through you, all the people of the world are going to be blessed. Now, this might have been a little bit hard for Abraham to hear or to understand at the time uh, because Abraham and Sarah, his wife, they were not young folks at this point. As a matter of fact, Abraham was well into his 90s at this point, and he didn't have any kids. So God, he called Abraham to go outside. Genesis chapter 15 He's like, I want you to look up at the stars in the sky, Abraham. Can you count those? Do you see how many there are? He's like, so shall your offspring be. And in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, it says that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was his belief That led to his righteousness. He was justified by faith in God. Now, uh, when it comes to a promise, a a promise is something that depends entirely on the promisor, right? So uh, today after the service, I'm like, hey, we go to lunch. I need to talk to you. I've got something really important I want to tell you. And if I took you to lunch and said, listen, I just like you. I think you're fantastic. You're the the best servant of the church. You're the best looking. I don't know, whatever the basis of it would be, if I said, I want to give you one million dollars, all of the responsibility for fulfilling that would be on me, right? Which in my case, if I promised you that, I couldn't come through with it. I don't have a million dollars. That would be a total lie and it wouldn't work out. But here's the thing about God. He keeps all of his promises. And before Abraham even knew about the law, before he had done any good works before God at all, God made a promise to Abraham, and all Abraham did was believe God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Justification by faith was God's plan the entire time, through all of history, throughout the entire Bible. This was his plan. But the Jews, somewhere after Abraham... They had gotten this mixed up, and they instead began to believe that they would be justified by a couple of things. The first was their lineage, and the second was by observance of the law. Now, y'all sang the song in children's church. You know it. Um, 
Father Abraham, and you get a march, right? Had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, so are you, so let's just praise the Lord, right? It's a great song. Every good Jew would have been able to trace their lineage back to Abraham, and they would have thought, listen, I am Abraham's blood. I'm a part of his descendants. The whole world is going to be blessed through me because I'm a part of Abraham. Like God made a promise, he's going to bless him, I get to receive that, and then God's going to bless the world through us. The Jews came to trust in their lineage that they might be justified before God. They're like, hey, we're God's chosen people, I'm of the nation of Israel, of this tribe goes all the way back to Abraham, I must be in good with God. But Paul is going to confront that notion here in verse 17. He says, I'm going to go back to 16. He says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. It does not say, and to offspring. So we're talking about singular versus plural. He's like, I'm not talking about uh, what, what what God didn't say was to your offsprings. That's the plural. He actually said to one, which means this. It doesn't say to offsprings referring to many, but instead referring to one. And to your offspring who is Christ. And what Paul is saying to the Jews and any of the people at Galatia is, hey, you you can't be depending upon your lineage. That you're like, hey, I'm justified before God because I can trace my lineage back to Abraham. I'm in the bloodline of Abraham, so I must be good with God. He's like, no, 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 no. Listen, if you want to know who that promise was to, you want to know how to be justified before God, it's not tracing the bloodline of Abraham. We are justified through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You want to receive the promise? It's not through the blood of Abraham, but rather it is through the blood of Jesus Christ that you will ultimately be justified. It wasn't to offsprings. It was to his one offspring through Jesus that God was going to make a great nation among the world and then ultimately bless the whole world through them. He's like the object there is Jesus and not merely the Jews, not merely the descendants of Abraham. Now the other thing that they trusted in to justify them before God was the observance of the law. So here's what Paul says as they move forward. Verse 17, he says, this is what I mean. He's trying to clarify. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God. So the question that would have maybe come into the minds of any good Jews or the people who were falling under the influence of the Judaizers is, how was Abraham justified? Because Abraham lived 430 years before the law was ever given. Which means Abraham never kept the law. Like he didn't observe the feast or the festivals. He didn't like undergo all of the, the, the ritual cleansings. He didn't like offer sacrifices in the same way that they did. Like Abraham didn't keep the law. How was he justified? And 430 years is a long time, right? It's about twice as long as we have been a nation. It was God's plan the entire time to justify the world through faith in Jesus and not through their lineage or through their observance of the law. Paul's like, how do you think people were saved before? How do you think Abraham was declared righteous? It wasn't by observance of the law because it didn't exist. And then he tells us something about the law that's really important. He's like, remember... When you have an agreement, you don't get to change it after it's been signed. God made a promise to Abraham, and he's going to keep his promise. Like that was not on contingent later upon their observance of the law. It was a promise made by God that he is absolutely going to fulfill. For, verse, six, or verse 18, For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by A promise. He's like, God's not a liar. He made a promise and he is going to keep it and it is not contingent upon observance of the law. The law has no part in our salvation. That is entirely the work of Jesus Christ, which we receive by faith in him. 
Now, here's a question that I had, and if you've been around church for very long, you've read much of the Old Testament, I remember having this growing up and trying to reconcile like the gospel, the good news I read in the New Testament, with the law of the Old Testament. And Paul anticipates this, and he, he asks a question for us. Look at what he says in verse 19. He says, why the law then? Y'all read Leviticus and Deuteronomy? There's a lot there. Why the law? Why, why did God even give the law? If he wasn't saving people through the law, what was he actually doing? In, in verse 19 it says, It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. And as a result, all of us were born with a sin nature. It is a proclivity to sin, like all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The law was added like that babysitter that I had to keep us in line, to point us in the right direction. Now, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, kind of big picture of the law, it was, there were three purposes that it had. One, it showed us God's holiness. The second thing the law did was show us our utter sinfulness. And if God is completely holy and we're completely sinful, what we understand is that we couldn't have fellowship with God. Like light can't have fellowship with darkness. And so the primary purpose of the law is to show us that we needed a Savior. That's why the law was given. 430 years after Abraham, the law was given to point us toward the Savior who was to come. The law prescribed sacrifices, blood sacrifices that had to be offered if our sins were to be atoned for, right? It was pointing us toward Jesus. Now, when it says here that the law was put in place through angels by an intermediary, and then an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one, I just need to confess to you guys, <clears throat> I don't know exactly what this means. Uh, I spent a lot of time studying this week. There's a lot of commentators and scholars who disagree widely on specifically what this means. And, and while we might be able to get into the various views, uh, what I think is important for you to understand here is that God's plan the entire time, throughout all of recorded history, since the founding of the world, God planned to justify the world through faith in Jesus Christ and not by observance of the law. In verse 21, he kind of continues answering the question, what is the law for? He asks, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? And he says, certainly not. He means God had a plan for the law, and he goes on further to tell us what that plan was. He says, for if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would have been according to the law. That's how it would have been given. But that's not the case. He says, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The scriptures, the law, they were given to us to imprison us under sin. To make it really clear to us that we were sinful and as a result we needed a savior. I don't know if you've ever tried to obey the law. Like read the old covenant, like read that stuff. Man, there's a ton there. And we can't uphold it. If you just shrunk it down to the ten commandments and that's all you tried to observe you will find that you can't keep it that your heart was just like my wicked eight-year-old heart right you want to go and get into things that the law should tell you you shouldn't get into you will crave those things you will pursue those things and if you're not careful things are going to get burnt right you will get hurt people will get hurt sin causes destruction the law the scriptures were given to us to imprison us under sin why so that we might be justified by faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior, and not by our own works. He's like, you don't deserve this. You cannot earn this. It's received by faith alone. He continues on in verse 22. He says, But the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus might be given to those who believe. Verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law. So we're prisoners and we're held captive under the law until the coming faith would be revealed. 
So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. The law was our guardian. Um, You might translate this tutor or teacher or even overseer. The law was a lot like our babysitter. It was to keep us from killing ourselves until Jesus would come, until we came to faith in Jesus Christ and no longer tried to justify ourselves before God on the basis of the law, but instead that we would be justified by faith in Jesus Christ alone, right? This is a joy. We've now been given Jesus Christ. So we're no longer under the teacher. We're no longer under the tutor. The law was a really good thermometer in our lives. It was kind of good at taking our temperature and showing us, hey, are you sick? Are you sinful? The law should show us that we are indeed sick and we are indeed sinful. But the law was a terrible thermostat. It could never change us. Now, the law did point us to the one who could. The law was like a road sign on our journey toward Jesus Christ. It would point us to him. You need a Savior. His name is Jesus. And he happened to die on the cross for your sins. And he was raised on the third day victorious over sin and death. That you might live an abundant life in him. And we receive all of this through faith in Christ. Right? Like This is where you get excited about what God has done. It's not about the law. But rather it's about Jesus and what he's done for you. And you were under a guardian before, but now that faith has come, look in verse 24. So the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But 25, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. The law was like that road sign that pointed us toward Jesus. It showed us that we needed the Savior. But once you arrive at your destination... Once you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, the law, that old road sign, and you might remember it fondly, like, hey, the law revealed to me I was a sinner in need of the Savior, and now I found the Savior. It was a road sign that pointed you toward Jesus. But once you reach the destination, you don't follow the road sign anymore. You have arrived, right? It's not, it's not like you come to faith in Jesus and spend the rest of your life making four left turns over and over and over and over, right? Trying to keep the law, even though you've reached your destination, which is Jesus. Like, we are no longer under the law. I hope that you've gotten that. It's clear for you. The law had a purpose, but that purpose has been fulfilled when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, verse 25, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. Y'all, we're not just children of Abraham, right? We're not just celebrating, you know, granddaddy Abe in our lives. Instead, we are sons and we are daughters of the living God. We are adopted by him. We now belong to him, which means that we are now heirs to the riches of God's kingdom. Like we get all of the fullness of all that our father has, and he has given that to us. Now, adoption in the ancient world was quite a bit different from how we often see it here. Like, uh, I had friends growing up who were adopted. Most of them, when they were adopted, they were little bitty babies, right? And for whatever reason, they were given up for adoption, and somebody went and, and chose them and adopted them, and they were raised up in their parents' household. That's not how adoption happened in the ancient world. Instead, in the ancient world, you would have a ruler or a noble or a prince, someone of great means who owned a great estate. And he might look at his heir and be like, we missed it with that boy. Like, he is not going to handle this very well. I, I don't think I can entrust my name and my estate to him. And so they would go looking for a worthy heir. Someone who could carry on the family name and carry on the family's estate that would manage the affairs well. And they would find a grown man who they believed to be faithful, who they believed would represent the family name well and and manage the estate well, and they would adopt him. And they would make them the heir apparent, the heir of their fortune, of their estate, of their kingdom, depending on how powerful they were. Now, you and I might look at ourselves and be like, I am not a worthy heir. I don't deserve to be adopted by God. I'm not going to handle his stuff. Well, like I'm, there's no way I'm that person. Well, here's the good news. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are made 
new, right? We become new creations in Christ Jesus. The old has gone, the new has come. And so we don't manage God's estate or bear his name in our own strength or our own power. We are now new creations who who live out our new calling as heirs, as children of God, according to the power of the Holy Spirit, which is profoundly different. Look what he says here in verse 28. He says, you are not what you once were. You're not the label that you once wore. You are no longer constrained by the things that once constrained you. You are now children of God. And this is the primary identity of your life. He says, you are, there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free. There's no male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. Do you want to know who inherits the promises or the promise that God made to Abraham? I'm going to bless you, make you into a great nation, bless the whole world through you. Do you know who gets to participate in that promise? And it's not just the sons and daughters of Abraham. Man, it's the sons and daughters of God. And we, we enter into that promise. We receive that promise by faith in Jesus Christ. Y'all, we did not earn that, right? And we, we don't deserve for God to do that. But that is the free gift that God gives us as a result of the promise. It was God's plan the entire time. The law was only supposed to point us toward our need for Jesus. I hope that you have received that by faith and you are living out your life as a son or a daughter of God and that you don't stare your limitations in the faith face every day and say, man, I can't because, but I hope that you see that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are an heir and you have received all of the benefits and the riches of God's kingdom. Now, as we close today, I want to talk to you about some of the, the benefits of being an heir to God's kingdom. You know, I went to college at Oklahoma State, and uh, I had quite a different experience from some of my friends, some people that I got to know there. Uh, when I was at Oklahoma State, I was pretty poor. Uh, so my, my dad would call me and be like, hey, you haven't been home in a long time. Like, you need to come see your mom. And I would say, all right, Dad, if you'll buy my gas, like, I can come home and see you. And he'd be like, okay, sure, we'll, we'll give you a tank of gas. Come home and see your family. But I had a friend at Oklahoma State who who lived quite a bit differently. She was indeed an heir. And when she wanted to go home to see her mom and dad, you know what she did? She called the pilot. And he would come pick her up in the jet, and he would take her home. Y'all, heirs live quite a bit differently than the rest of the world. Like, they have a different worldview and a different outlook on life. They are not constrained by the same things that constrain non-heirs. So, number one, privileges the the privilege that we have as heirs of God the first is this heirs enjoy the privilege of sonship or daughtership I didn't want to write that word out because it's a weird word but heirs get to enjoy the privileges of sonship or daughtership and here's what that means for you you have direct access to the living God of this world who spoke all that we know and see into existence. Like, God isn't constrained like we're constrained, right? He doesn't like, oh, well, here, I'm going to give you a little bit of gas money for, for your car, right? He's got the jet. God owns it all. He speaks things into existence, and he welcomes us, and he invites us to come to him and say, God, here is that thing that's on my mind. Here's the thing that's concerning me. Man, here is that burden that's been weighing me down. God, would you work on my behalf? And he is a good father who delights to work on behalf of his children. Now sometimes he might have to tell us no. Sometimes he might let us wrestle with things for a while, but we have full rights as sons and daughters of God to boldly approach the throne of grace for help in our time of need. Like I want you to know this. God is for you. He knows your name. He knows what you're wrestling with. He knows that thing that's keeping you up at night, and he wants to work on your behalf. He wants you to come to him with with your struggles and with your problems. In the ancient world, um, you'll read this in Esther in particular, um, kings were so powerful that you weren't even allowed to approach them Unless you were summoned upon penalty of death. Just to show up in front of the king and be like, hey, I got a request. Like, if you were to do that, you could be put to death. But Tim Keller points out that the kingdom of God is so much different. He asks this question. He says, do you know... 
who dares to wake a king up at 3 a.m. and to ask him for a glass of water in the middle of the night? You know who has that privilege? It's the king's son and daughter. And the king, that powerful king, delights to get up in the middle of the night and to get his child, his son or his daughter, a glass of water because they ask him for it. And maybe that's you today. And there's something you've been carrying. And you have to remember that you're a son or a daughter and that God cares for you. And it's time to bring that thing to him in prayer and ask him to work on your behalf. You might not be able to handle it, but he certainly can. Number two, heirs understand the responsibility of of stewarding what has been entrusted to them. Heirs aren't earners. You know what I mean? Heirs are the recipients of something that they did not earn. They get to inherit what God has given them, right? We don't earn it. God freely gives it to us. But as such, we have a responsibility to steward all that God has given us. Our time, our talents, our abilities, our opportunities, the very gospel itself. We are stewards of the riches that God has given to us. And he empowers us by his spirit to manage those things well. Our lives were never made to be all about us, but rather we are supposed to represent the family name, to carry that well, to honor God with our lives and the way that we live. And so here, here's maybe the, the token phrase for you as you think about being a steward. You and I were blessed in order to be a blessing. Remember the promise? I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless the world through you. Man, God has chosen to adopt us as his sons and daughters that he might bless the world through us. You want to know meaning. You want to know purpose. You want to know intimacy with God. Allow him to begin to work through you as you steward all that he has given you for his glory. So heirs, man, they have all the rights and privileges as sons and daughters of God. They understand the responsibility of stewarding what's been entrusted. And then this final point, heirs, don't fear the future. Because our future is made secure. Heirs don't fear the future because our future is made secure. I love uh, King David who wrote the 23rd Psalm. King David was was a, a man who as a young boy had slain Goliath. He had seen the power of God at work in him and through him. They sang songs about his military conquests. It's like, hey, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. He was a great warrior who became a powerful king. He commanded mighty armies. But it was that King David who was rich and powerful and mighty in battle. Listen to the words he wrote about the Lord and to the things that he ultimately trusted in. Look what he says here in the 23rd Psalm. David said, The Lord is my shepherd. He's the one who's caring for me. He's the one that's overseeing my life. He's the one that's directing my path. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures where there is plenty. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Listen, as heirs, we don't have to fear the future because our future is secure. Our great God is our provider. And we may not know how God is going to provide or how he's going to work, but we can trust in him. We're heirs. We're sons and daughters of God. Our future is secure. Maybe you're here today and you don't know how God's going to make it work. You don't know how he's going to provide. I want you to know you can have faith and trust in him because our God is a God who keeps his promises. David continues on. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But he continues, and he's like, he's not just my provision, but God is also my protection. Even though he commanded powerful armies, he was a valiant warrior. He says, the Lord is my protection. Look what he says in verse 4. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, not because of my armor, not because of my army, but because God is with me. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. He says, God is my provision and God is my protection. And it doesn't matter what I have or what I could do. It matters who God is, what he has and what he can do. 
He's like, you know what? And I don't trust in what I can make happen for my life. I don't trust in my plans or, or what's there. But instead, I trust in God's plans, that he has good plans for me. He concludes, he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And is that your view of your life? And are you living a life of faith in God and His power, in His provision, in His protection, and in His plans? Do you believe that He has good plans for you? Or are you living a life full of anxiety and fear, trying to control what's there when your Father already has it taken care of for you? Heirs don't fear the future because their future is made secure. Listen, it was God's plan the entire time to save the world through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. That's all of His work. That's the promise that He made and this promise that we can receive by faith in Him. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you've never trusted in Him to save you, I want to invite you to trust Him today. Man, may God fill your heart with faith that you might surrender your all to Him and come to know the God of the universe who cares for you. Maybe for you, it's time to start relating to God as a son or a daughter. Man, you're not a stepkid. You're not unwanted. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you, that you might be saved and you might become an heir, that you might bring him every concern, every struggle that you ultimately have. Maybe today it's time to start relating to him as a son or a daughter. Maybe for you it's time to start stewarding what God has given you for the sake of his kingdom. And that you will live your life for God's glory to build his kingdom and not merely to build yours. Maybe there's someone in your life that needs to hear the gospel and God is calling you and empowering you by his spirit to go and to share that. Let me encourage you today. You have been blessed to be a blessing. Trust the Lord and watch what he'll do through your willingness. Maybe you're here today and it's time to trust God with your future. And you've been racked with fear and worry. What's going to happen? What's going to happen with my kids? What's going to happen with my health? What's going to happen with our country? Listen, your Heavenly Father has it entirely under His control. You don't need to fret. You don't need to fear. You only need to respond in faith to Him. And so today, I don't know what God may be working in your heart. But I believe he wants you to respond in faith. No matter who you are, what's going on in your life, he wants you to respond in faith. So I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to stand and have a time of response. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your work, for your power, for your provision. God, that you are sovereign over everything. And God, we thank you that you're good. That it was your plan the whole time to justify us by faith in you and not by our works. I pray that today might be the day of salvation for somebody. Lord, I pray that today might be the day that somebody entrusts their future to you and quits living in fear and starts walking in faith. I pray that today that son or daughter may begin to relate to you as a child who would come to you eagerly anticipating your good blessings upon their life. And I pray this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand?